Welcome everyone who's joining. Thank you for being with us this afternoon. I'm sure everybody has a busy day and it means a lot to us that you found the time to be here. My name is Paige Bellenbaum. I'm a licensed social worker and the founding director here at the Motherhood Center. And we are very, very happy to be able to bring uh, this very important informational session to you uh, with a focus on one of the most uh, severe and acute forms of a perinatal mood and anxiety disorder, uh, which is postpartum psychosis. And it is a great honor of mine to be able to introduce to you one of our reproductive psychiatrists here at the Motherhood Center, Dr. Annie Hart. Um, I'm gonna read you her bio quickly. I'm gonna give you two second spiel about who we are and what we do at the Motherhood Center. And then I'm gonna pass it over to Dr. Hart, uh, who's gonna talk to us all about postpartum psychosis today. Dr. Hart is a board certified psychiatrist specializing in perinatal mental health. She received her bachelor's degree from Juilliard School where she majored in cello performance. She completed medical school and psychiatry residency training at the ICANN School of Medicine at Mount Sinai, where she served as chief resident. In tandem with her medical training, she received training in psychoanalytic psychotherapy at the New York Psychoanalytic Society Institute and the William Allenson White Institute. Dr. Hart completed her fellowship in reproductive psychiatry at the Motherhood Center and serves as voluntary faculty at the ICANN School of Medicine at Mount Sinai Hospital. It is a great honor to introduce you to Dr. Hart. Um, and for those of you who are new to the Motherhood Center and might be hearing about us for the very first time, we are a clinical treatment facility that provides uh, treatment and support to pregnant and postpartum women and birthing people experiencing perinatal mood and anxiety disorders. Acronym for that is PMADS. We offer support groups, outpatient therapy and medication management with reproductive psychiatrists. And what we're very, very well known for is our perinatal partial hospitalization program for women that have a severe and acute psychiatric illness in the perinatal period. We treat many women that are stepping down from inpatient facilities that were hospitalized with postpartum psychosis. So we are a perfect step down uh, for women when they're getting out of the hospital and a perfect step up for patients that need a higher level of care than outpatient uh, treatment can offer. Um, so without further ado, I'm gonna hand it over to Dr. Hart. Thank you for the introduction, Paige, and I'm really excited to be talking to all of you today about postpartum psychosis. Um, it's very near to my heart, as, and we see a lot of patients um, who come to, the, come to treatment after an episode of postpartum psychosis. Um, and I think part of why I'm so invested in, in these kinds of trainings is that postpartum psychosis is, while it's severe and sometimes scary, is also very treatable. Um, and so want to just give everybody information about how the illness presents um, and how to approach treatment with, um, with your patients and other people in your life. So objectives for today. So just an overview of the clinical presentation of postpartum psychosis, making the diagnosis, accounting to, for risk, and then approach to treatment. Um, so I know we've got a lot of different people here today, um, so uh, we'll try to cover um, information that feels relevant to everybody. So first of all, you know, what is postpartum psychosis? Um, we'll talk in a minute about the clinical presentation, but as, as Paige mentioned, it's a very rare and very severe illness that occurs in the postpartum period. It's generally considered to be an affective disorder. Um, and by that, you know, typically we think of this as falling in the bipolar illness spectrum. Um, and the reason why I bring this up is because even though it presents with symptoms of psychosis, phenomenologically, it's actually more related to bipolar illness. Um, and, and that I think has a significant effect on how we approach treatment. Um, and how we conceptualize the illness. So, you know, his, I think in my training, at least I was always taught bipolar illness is 
uh, postpartum psychosis is bipolar illness until proven otherwise. Um, and I think this holds true in the sense that in terms of medications, treatment looks the same regardless of what the diagnosis may be. Um, but it's also important to know that actually a significant subset of people experience postpartum psychosis um, in only isolated to the postpartum episode and may not have any other um, experience, may, may not have any other episodes of, of mania or depression outside of the acute postpartum period. Um, it's often called the or an orphan illness, um, in part because it's not um, it's not necessarily recognized by the DSM five as a distinct disorder. Um, it's categorized as a brief psychotic disorder with postpartum onset, which I think reflects a lot of what what we still don't know about postpartum psychosis because um, there's a lot of ongoing debate of where does this belong in the DSM and how do we how do we categorize and conceptualize postpartum psychosis um, as a field. So in terms of the clinical presentation, um, there can be mood symptoms. Uh, this can include irritability, depressed mood, um, anxiety. Um, I think what we that what what is often kind of the most prominent symptoms um, that distinguish it from other mood disorders are some of the psychotic symptoms. So this can include abnormal or bizarre thought content. Um, often this is related to childbirth um, and can sometimes develop into more paranoid or persecutory delusions. So, you know, we've had several patients who felt that the um, delivery experience and, and the care providers in the hospital were, uh, were, were kind of involved in a scheme to try to, try to harm them. Um, patients can also have religious delusions, um, much like a, a you know, sort of be religiously preoccupied, much like in a manic episode, um, and this can often um, include the infant. So um, some examples that come to my mind are one patient who thought that she um, she thought that she was Jesus Christ. And interestingly, her mother had had an episode of postpartum psychosis and her mother's delusion was that she was the Virgin Mary and had given birth to Jesus Christ. So, it, it, you know, it, it's 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 interesting. I, I bring that up to give a couple of examples of the kinds of delusions some of the patients that I've seen have had, um, and um, and also how this can be. Uh, it's it's also a very heritable um, disorder, which we'll get to in a little bit. Um, some of the perceptual disturbances can include auditory. Or visual hallucinations, you know, patients might hear voices um, of someone talking to them. Sometimes these can be command auditory hallucinations telling them to do something or harm themselves, harm the baby. Um, and then sometimes they can have visual distortions that can range from sort of, you know, shadows or, or, or um, you know, changes to the way they perceive color, um, but sometimes they can extend to, to frank hallucinations. So we had one patient who, when she looked at her baby, saw the face of a monster in her baby um, and really visualized in that way. I think an important characteristic of uh, postpartum psychosis is also the cognitive changes that present kind of like a delirium. Um, so this can look like disorganized behavior, disorientation. Um, and I think what's in, you know, classically it's been described as more of a sort of waxing and waning of cognition. So patients may actually present at one point in time um, as, as fairly well appearing, but, but then um, given the waxing and waning nature of their uh, of the illness 
uh, they can at other times present as quite ill. Um, so I think that comes into play when you're when you're thinking about treatment because you want to make sure that they're really consistently in a in um, uh, you want to keep in mind that that even short term improvement um, may be actually a waxing and waning of the illness itself. Um, sleep disturbance is a really uh, key part of, of the presentation. Um, what we often see is a decreased need for sleep, which again fits with how we think of, of mania. Um, and sleep is both a precipitant of postpartum psychosis in that in the postpartum people, people aren't really sleeping very well. So the lack of sleep can sometimes precipitate an episode. Um, and then it's also a symptom as well. Um, and then finally, the, the, the most tragic outcomes of, of untreated illness are suicide and infanticide, um, which can occur in four to five percent of individuals who have a postpartum psychosis episode. So I think this really highlights the need for, um, for good treatment for these patients to prevent that outcome. I wanted to give, there was a recent article a few years ago that really characterized a few phenotypes of postpartum psychosis. So it doesn't look the same on everybody. Um, and I think some of this may also reflect the underlying etiology, um, which is variable. Um, so some, some patients present in a more manic state. Um, so in terms of mood symptoms, there's more irritability, agitation, and then some of the other features like pressured speech and, um, uh, and decreased need for sleep. Um, what was significant was actually in the study found that a majority, 41% of individuals uh, actually presented with more of a depressive picture. Um, with low mood, anxiety. Um, and I think what's tricky about this is that it can more often be undetected or under, undertreated if it's thought of as a depression uh, rather than as a post as a as postpartum psychosis. Um, and then in about a quarter of patients have an atypical presentation um, that that involves a more delirium like picture. So um, more pronounced waxing and waning effect. Um, and, and disorientation. Um, and I think, you know, as we, as we learn more in the field, these, these phenotypes may in the future have implications for prognosis, underlying cause, and um, how we approach treatment. In terms of the clinical course of postpartum psychosis, um, the Highest risk period is really in the immediate postpartum. So um, onset tends to be very rapid. Um, and typically we see this occur within the first four weeks after delivery. That being said, it can happen throughout the first year of postpartum. Uh, occasionally, you know, less, less often, but we have had patients who have who have presented several months after delivery. And sometimes there's maybe a, um, a mild illness that's been brewing that then sort of becomes more pronounced. Um, and that may be what brings them into, into treatment. Um, part of the reason it's called postpartum psychosis is because it really is, is seen in the postpartum period. Although for, patient, for patients with bipolar disorder, we always say pregnancy is not protective. Um, so in terms of, so in the acute period, it, it really is, the highest risk period really is within the first few weeks, um, but symptoms can persist for up to a year postpartum, particularly if, if they're not treated. Um, if they are treated, most women will actually resume functioning within nine months and, and make a very fairly full recovery. Um, in terms of the risk of recurrence, with subsequent pregnancies, about a third of patients may have a recurrent episode um, in, in later pregnancies. 
And we'll talk a little bit later about how, how to approach uh, future pregnancies and, and prevention. Um, the risk of recurrence is highest with, with among patients who have an isolated episode of postpartum psychosis. So the pathophysiology, um, I think the underlying cause of postpartum psychosis is something that we're still trying to understand. Clearly childbirth is a trigger and there are a lot of both physiologic changes, um, emotional, psychological changes, and then functional changes that occur, especially in that first couple of weeks. Um, so sleep disturbances are really as I mentioned earlier, one of the biggest precipitants, um, not sleeping can really affect your cognition. Um, and a lot of times for individuals who have a postpartum psychosis episode and they may have an underlying bipolar illness that gets triggered by the insomnia that comes with feeding and caring for a newborn. And so um, trying to help patients protect their sleep postpartum is a, is a really important factor to uh, counsel patients on before they deliver. Um, the hormonal changes have also been uh, considered when we think about the pathophysiology. Um, in the postpartum period, there's a huge decline of reproductive hormones um, and which have also downstream effects on the HPA axis, and, and uh, these have, have been uh, hypothesized to, to be related to um, the cause of postpartum psychosis. The, another, another factor may be immune changes. Um, there are a lot of, you know, pregnancy is an immunocompromised state, and so there are a lot of changes to the immune system, both during pregnancy and in the, in the postpartum period, um, and some pro-inflammatory markers have been identified as, as possibly related. Um, and then there's also genetic polymorphisms that may, uh, that, that may help us understand a genetic basis. Um, so chromosome 16 P, P13 and MET-L13 have, have, uh, have shown to have some signal um, when we're looking at sort of genetic polymorphisms that, that might be associated with postpartum psychosis. In terms of the epidemiology, it is quite rare. The incidence ranges between 0 0.9 and 2.6 per 1,000 births. Um, that risk is much higher among women who have pre-existing bipolar disorder. So, 260 out of 1,000 women with bipolar disorder um, may go on to have a postpartum psychosis episode. Um, the, um, and the relative risk of, of postpartum psychosis is 23 times higher in the first four weeks postpartum than any other time in a woman's life. Um, in terms of who goes who has an isolated episode and who goes on to have bipolar illness 50 80% of individuals who have an episode will go on to have subsequent manic or depressive episodes um, that meet criteria for uh, bipolar disorder um, and more recent epidemiologic studies have found that actually there's a, a significant proportion of women who have who may have an episode that's really isolated to the postpartum, and that number ranges from twenty to fifty percent of individuals. Um, another uh, another thing to consider is the high mortality of postpartum psychosis. So there's a high risk of of both suicide and infanticide. The numbers range between four and five percent uh, for both for the risk of of suicide and infanticide during a, an acute episode. So some risk factors to take into account, um, a personal history of bipolar disorder or of postpartum psychosis is probably the strongest risk factor. Family history of bipolar disorder or of a postpartum psychosis episode is also really important. Um, 
I mentioned one patient whose mother had uh, postpartum psychosis. And we actually had a patient recently whose mother had both a postpartum psychosis episode and a perimenopausal psychosis episode. Um, and so, so many patients do have a strong family history that can that can be predictive of their own uh, experience postpartum. Um, other things can that can increase the risk. So discontinuation of psychiatric medications in pregnancy. Um, this is more significant for patients with bipolar disorder, um, but that does increase the risk significantly. Also, preemie parities, so first pregnancies, um, are are often at higher risk. And then individuals who have a history of sensitivity to hormonal changes. So so folks who may have PMDD or you know, they may have been sensitive to oral contraceptions. Um, that can be one, one um, risk factor that can, that can increase the risk for postpartum. So in terms of the differential diagnosis, um, in many ways, postpartum psychosis has a pretty, uh, you know, distinct presentation, but we do want to think about other things that might might um, that might be going on that can some sometimes resemble postpartum psychosis. The baby blues, I think this is a little bit less so because we don't typically see um, the sorts of hallucinations or um, or paranoid thinking with the baby blues, um, but it is something to to keep on the differential. Um, Postpartum depression can sometimes present with psychotic features, and that can look a lot like postpartum psychosis. Um, peripartum OCD is is another uh, TMAD that I think can often mimic postpartum psychosis in the level of distress, in sort of some of the the thoughts that are that are unusual or bizarre. Um, Patients may have intrusive thoughts that could be misinterpreted as uh, auditory hallucinations or um, or even delusions, um, and so that sometimes making that diagnosis can be can be can be tricky. Um, generalized anxiety disorder or panic disorder can sometimes uh, look like postpartum psychosis, although a little bit less so. And then, and then we want to think about drug effects, whether that's substance intoxication or withdrawal, um, or the effects of medications such as steroids that can induce psychosis, um, and other medical etiologies like delirium, encephalitis, autoimmune processes, or um, thyroid or hyperparathyroid changes in the postpartum. In terms of diagnosis and screening, um, the diagnosis is really a clinical diagnosis uh, made by careful assessment, um, ruling out other factors, and, and obtaining collateral information from, from the patient's friends or families to really understand the whole picture of, of what they've, what's been going on for them in the postpartum. There's no validated screening tool for postpartum psychosis. Um, you know, you can use some of the tools that we can use include uh, screeners for bipolar illness um, or the EPDS and GAD7 um, to look for mood or anxiety symptoms. Um, although none of these are really diagnostic, uh, diagnostic, useful diagnostic tools for postpartum psychosis. That being said, I think it's helpful to really think about what questions do you want to ask the patient to to understand what's going on and to make the diagnosis. Um, and it relates a lot to a lot of the concerns we were talking about earlier with, in terms of risk factors. Um, so is this the first, the first presentation? Many patients, for many patients, they don't have any psychiatric history at all. And this is actually the first time that something like this has ever happened to them. Um, but having a pre-existing history of depression or of uh, of bipolar disorder is all, also would really lean lean towards a, a, a diagnosis. Um, 
You also want to ask about family history. Is there a family history of bipolar disorder um, or of, of a postpartum mood or psychotic disorder? Um, has there been any recent substance use? Um, and then you also want to just assess about thoughts of harm to the infant, which we'll talk about in a few minutes. In terms of the medical workup, you want to be uh, you want to do a comprehensive medical workup to ensure that um, there's not another reason why a patient might be experiencing symptoms. So this includes a physical, a neurologic exam, um, a complete metabolic panel, complete blood count, urinalysis, uh, urine toxicology screening, thyroid hormones, so TSH and T4, ammonia levels. Um, these can all help to either identify an underlying medical cause or rule out a medical cause. Um, and then finally, brain imaging, a CT or MRI. This is uh, most indicated if the patient has active neurologic symptoms as well. So I wanted to talk a bit about infanticide, um, and I wanted to start with some of the cases that we've that we've seen in the news because unfortunately um, infanticide is, is a risk of untreated postpartum psychosis. Um, and it's been featured more prominently in the news recently, um, but, but it's, I, and, I, and I will say, I think the way that the news talks about these individuals has changed over time. Um, and yet we still see language that really blames the mother um, and criminalizes the mother um, for infanticide when in fact it's, I think it's, it's really a, a horrific outcome of an, of an illness. Um, and uh, I think our criminal justice system has a long way to go to, to adequately help these women and, and understand why, why, they're, um, why they have taken the lives of their children um, because it's coming from a place of illness um, rather than, um, than a, a criminal intent. So the risk of infanticide in the United States overall, about eight in 100,000 infants um, die by infanticide in the US. Um, among mothers who, com uh, who complete infanticide or filicide, 16 to 29% will also take their own lives. Um, other causes of infanticide that don't include mental illness are fetal maltreatment, abuse, or unwanted pregnancy. Um, so psychiatric disorders associated with psychotic processes do make up a significant amount of, uh, of infanticide occurrences. Um, as I mentioned earlier, the risk of infanticide among mothers with postpartum psychosis is 4%. And often, the motivation to take the life of the child is com is coming from a, a delusional place. And, and we talk about altruistic delusions as a way to understand this, because I think a lot of people, their first thought is, why would a mother kill their child? Um, and as we've seen with um, many of our patients or, or many of the patients, um, the people who have, who have been featured prominently in the news, uh, a lot of a lot of times they really are are taking the life of the child in the effort in an effort to protect them, whether that's from a belief a paranoid belief that that someone else will hurt them and that will be worse, or um, a religious delusion about um, trying to trying to save them or, or protect them somehow for the um, afterlife. Um, in terms of risk factors that are specific for infanticide, active psychosis, as we've been talking about, young maternal age, unemployment, history of child abuse, um, and victims of intimate partner violence or 
um, at an elevated risk. In terms of assessing for this risk, it can sometimes be hard to find the language. So I wanted to, to really give both an overview of, of the kinds of things that we think about and then how to ask the patient. Um, so I think first and foremost is asking about the baby um, and then asking if they've experienced any thoughts of, of harm. One way that I often phrase it is that it's not uncommon to have thoughts of bad things happening to the baby. Um, in fact, up to 80 to 90% of women might have intrusive thoughts of harm coming to the baby um, and, and then would ask the mother, have you had thoughts or experienced images of accidental or even intentional harm coming to the baby? Um, and as I mentioned, intrusive thoughts of harm are actually quite common and don't aren't necessarily diagnostic of, of postpartum psychosis, but um, I think talking about it in that language can be a helpful way for patients to feel comfortable sharing what what their what kinds of thoughts they've been having. Um, then you want to go on to kind of elicit to understand how much is paranoia and how much is anxiety. Um, so I'll often ask open-ended questions. How much, how much do you worry about the safety of your baby? Um, and then from there, try to understand why it is that they're that they're worried about the baby and does do these worries, are they are these worries reality-based or are they maybe of a more um, delusional, coming from a more delusional process? Um, you also want to elicit the nature of the delusion. So I will kind of go into sometimes detail with the patient of trying to understand who would try to hurt your baby. Why would they do that? Um, and these these kinds of probing questions can often help elucidate what's going on in the patient's mind. And then finally, asking about command auditory hallucinations. So have you heard in have you heard any voices telling you to harm your baby? Um, and we've had a couple patients who have who, who had that experience, and often it's it's quite scary to them, even when they're in a psychotic and disoriented state. Um, another important thing when you're doing an assessment for someone who you're worried about, I think it's very very important to get collateral from friends, from family, and from their healthcare providers. Um, just to fill out the picture of what, what has been going on for this person. Um, so you want to ask for both, both for supporting information to get to, to help fill out that picture. And then you also want to engage family and social supports in safety planning. Um, and in the event that some, you know, the patient needs to go to the hospital, um, and to, to help maintain safety for the infant. If, you know, if there's a patient for whom we have a real concern of postpartum psychosis, we would usually recommend that they go to the hospital right away. Um, and hopefully a family member is available to take them there. Um, and, you know, if it's not possible for any reason, making sure that the, that the patient is never alone with the infant until they can get to a higher level of care. So, as we're talking about this, I wanted to make a make a chart to, that sort of outlines different types of harm thoughts that do occur, um, and in part for diagnostic purposes, and also just to think about risk and how we categorize risk based on what the underlying etiology is of the the harm thought. So, as we've talked about with postpartum psychosis the kinds of thoughts they have are typically altruistic delusions um, to prevent earthly suffering based on, and it's based on delusional content, whether that's religious in nature or like a persecutory delusion. Um, the thought will often be like, uh, I must drown my baby to save them for, from eternal damn, damnation. Um, and the patients often have poor insight into these thoughts, meaning, you know, they, they feel invested in these thoughts that they're real, that they're happening, that the that the risks are um, a real threat to them. This can 
this, uh, this, these thoughts can also be associated with behaviors. Um, so, you know, when patients do act on thoughts, it tends to be more sudden and impulsive. It's it's kind of hard to prepare for, um, maybe preceded by bizarre behavior, um, and often is a response to command auditory hallucinations to harm the child. Um, with de So postpartum psychosis, we really think of as the, the highest risk category for infanticide. Um, for patients with depression, uh, we do some, they do sometimes have thoughts of, of infant harm. Um, and what's most commonly seen is, is an extension of the suicidal ideation. So, you know, a mom might be considering taking her own life and is thinking about taking the child with them sort of secondary to the, to the, to her own suicidal ideation. Um, these are also often coming from a place of altruism that their motivation is to take the child's life rather than leave the child motherless. Um, we've had a couple of patients who thankfully did not act on these thoughts, but did disclose to us that they had been seriously considering not only their, their own suicide plan, but also that they didn't, you know, they didn't want to leave the child behind to burden family or to live with the trauma of having a, having a mother who died by suicide. Um, so this is a quote, actually, this is a direct quote from a patient I, um, who was thinking like, I should take my baby with me so that they don't have to endure the trauma of my suicide. Um, these, in terms of associated behaviors, these tend to be more premeditated and might be accompanied by preparatory acts. So things like stockpiling pills or, um, or finding weapons. Um, and when it comes to the bait, when it comes to the baby, you know, some one of the things we look for with suicide is is whether that they've made plans for for childcare after their demise, um, and and so that's just something to consider when you're treating a depressed patient. Um, and I think postpartum psychosis is the highest risk. Depression is generally a lower risk, but sometimes patients with depression might have some psychotic features. Um, that does put them at an elevated risk uh, for inf infanticide. And then finally, we have obsessive compulsive disorder or OCD, which you know the, the risk of, of acting on thoughts of harm is exceedingly low and has not been reported as a, as a cause for infanticide. Um, but I include it here because it can it can look a lot like or sound a bit like, postpartum psychosis and and just wanted to make sure that we um that you have that you come away with a clear understanding of like how to distinguish these different um PMADs. So with OCD, patients typically experience intrusive thoughts or images of of accidental or purposeful infant harm. Sometimes this might look like, you know, intrusive thoughts of throwing them down the stairs or throwing them out the window, um, or stabbing the baby. Um, and I think under kind of assessing the patient's reactions to these thoughts gives you a lot of information uh, to be able to assess the acute risk. Because for patients with OCD, these thoughts are extremely distressing and ego dystonic. They, they really don't wanna act on the thoughts. They don't know why they're having the thoughts. Um, and feel pretty horrified by the thoughts. Um, and, and often in a response to the thought, they'll engage in safety behaviors to avoid harm. Um, you know, so this again is, is a kind of thought that, that one of my patients had. We see, they'll often be kind of what if thoughts, like what if this happened or an image of the thing happening itself. So what if I threw my baby out the window and then that patient may take extreme precautions to make sure all the windows are locked, to not be alone in the room with the baby, um, and um, or remove any objects that might harm the baby. Um, so, you know, you can kind of see in the presentation the thoughts and the the behaviors that 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 
uh, patients have with these various PMADs um, that they can present with some similarities, some overlap, but but are are quite distinct from one another and carry a very different um, level of risk. So postpartum psychosis and to some extent depression with psychotic features being at elevated risk for infant harm, whereas OCD is really an exceedingly low risk. So now we're gonna talk about approach to treatment. So if you have a patient who you think may have postpartum psychosis, uh, it's, it's a psychiatric emergency and they need to be hospitalized inpatient immediately uh, for medication management, stabilization and safety. They sort of meet all of the criteria for inpatient admission and, and it really is not something that is uh, reasonable to treat at home until the patient is adequately stabilized. Pharmacologic treatment is necessary. Medications are necessary in order to stabilize the patient. Um, and, then, and, and then we also think beyond the acute episode about maintenance and prevention. Um, and luckily we, we know a lot about what treatments work for this population. Um, so treatment is very, very effective. Um, and, but medications are necessary. And then the role of psychotherapy, I think, is something that people are still trying to understand. Because it's such a rare illness, we, we don't have a lot of experience or data about psychotherapeutic interventions for this population. Um, but we do know that psychoeducation is very helpful, you know, helping them understand what's going on, why it's happening, helping partners understand. Um, and helping patients just establish a sense of safety and containment after something like this has happened. Because typically it's it's such a, a striking and severe presentation, but typically patients can reconstitute fairly quickly. And it can be really jarring to understand and to understand why that happened and to feel safe in their thoughts after, after an episode. And then more long-term processing the psychological trauma of postpartum psychosis uh, can be very complex and there can be a lot of feelings of guilt or shame um, and fear. Um, and so understanding the illness is, is an important part of, of being able to help patients in a therapeutic session setting um, beyond the acute episode. Um, in terms of acute stabilization, so, you know, this is done typically in, in an inpatient setting. Um, in, in England and the UK, they have mother baby units where patients can be hospitalized with their baby. Um, but unfortunately, we, we, we don't have mother baby units, um, certainly not in New York City, and there might be one or two that are, that are coming up um, in the United States. And that's kind of an ideal setting um, because then the, the the mothers can stay with their babies um, while they're receiving treatment in a safe setting. Um, but you know, in in the United States, this is typically done on a general adult inpatient psychiatric unit. So in terms of medications, we treat it kind of like a manic episode. Um, so the combination of a mood stabilizer, typically lithium, which is the gold standard. Uh, for bipolar disorder. Um, an antipsychotic is often necessary uh, for, for the acute period. Um, so we tend to favor more potent antipsychotics such as Zyprexa or Haldol. And then a benzodiazepine can be really helpful too just to reduce distress and help patients sleep at night. Um, and some, some options that we like are Ativan or Clonopin. Um, the good news is that postpartum psychosis is very treatable and that if they're on the right medication regimen, 98% of patients, uh, will go into remission of acute symptoms and will, will stay in remission. Um, I, I mentioned medications that are typically used, but you can also consider ECT if, if a patient's not responding to medications. <clears throat> 
In terms of maintenance, so once once you're out of that acute phase and and symptom remission is achieved, uh, you want to can definitely continue the lithium for one year after the episode, um, but you can go ahead and taper the benzos and the antipsychotics. My, you know, my there's not one protocol or guideline around this, but uh, typically what we do is is reduce the benzo as tolerated, and we'll kind of keep it on board as a as an PRN as needed for insomnia or activation and that can often help if if any anything starts to you know if, if patients start to to develop early symptoms of mania benzos can be really helpful on a prn basis um, in terms of the antipsychotic we typically keep those on board for six months after the episode um, you can reduce the dose to assuming that you're reducing it to a therapeutic dose. Um, and for a lot of folks going off of the antipsychotic, um, a lot of folks are, are stable on just lithium monotherapy following an episode. However, some, some patients, especially those with more severe illness, may require two mood stabilizers uh, in order, in order to, to maintain stability. So um, just to to have open conversations with your patients about how to plan for medication changes after an episode. Um, and then most importantly is to continue lithium for a full year following the episode. Um, you can over time, and we'll get into this in a minute, but um, you know, during an episode, we titrate to slightly higher doses of lithium between 0.8 and 1.2, but once a patient's been stabilized, you can reduce the dose to a lower lower level between 0.6 and 0.8 for maintenance. Um, and one study out of the Netherlands found that, that, that um, in their population, 80% of patients uh, were in remission at nine months with lithium monotherapy. So lithium really has the best evidence for treating uh, postpartum psychosis, both in the acute phase and uh, and in in um, over the course of their recovery and maintenance. So we also talk about prophylaxis. Um, so this, you know, we would consider for patients who have previously had an episode of postpartum psychosis um, and. Um, and did not go on to develop other manic or depressive symptoms, um, they're still at a really high risk for a subsequent episode postpartum. So you wanna closely monitor throughout pregnancy um, for any signs or symptoms of, of depression or mania or, or psychotic symptoms, particularly in the third trimester. Um, as we mentioned, postpartum is really the highest risk period. So um, you wanna encourage sleep protection. Um, this can become pretty involved um, because <laughs> as many of you may know, it's very hard to protect your sleep when you have a, have a newborn. Um, but some strategies that we'll often talk about with patients is to take shifts with partners, to, to have a real conversation about breastfeeding and whether breastfeeding is going to be appropriate for the patient um, because that does really necessitate, I think breastfeeding or especially exclusively breastfeeding can really necess necessitate waking up every two to three hours, um, which is, 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 you know, that the insomnia of, of the initial newborn phase really is one of the main precipitants to developing a, a psychotic episode. Um, and then finally with medications, um, you know, we would recommend initiating lithium postpartum to prevent a recurrence. Sometimes this is done in the third trimester so that you can, um, at the end of the third trimester, so you can establish a therapeutic dose um, and so, or sometimes we will just start it postpartum. I also, I wanted to add a couple of things about prophylaxis when you're considering a patient who does have pre-existing uh, bipolar illness. So 
it's a chronic illness. It requires ongoing management. Um, and the, as we've been talking about, the peripartum is a high risk period for depression, mania, and psychosis. Um, so talk to your patients early, even in preconception planning about how to manage their illness um, and maintain their stability throughout pregnancy and postpartum. Uh, a really important part of that is to continue their medications. So this is, you know, this is a maybe a, a longer conversation for a, another for another uh, lecture on bipolar illness, but the majority of mood stabilizers can be administered during pregnancy and postpartum. Um, and it's really important that patients stay on their medications and that they are at, at a therapeutic dose. Um, during pregnancy, sometimes um, due to the uh, hemodiluting effects of increased blood volume in pregnancy, increased GFR, so the, the medications might be renally cleared more, more rapidly. A lot of times the levels of the medications decline over the course of pregnancy, so it's important that they're regularly monitored um, by their psychiatrists and getting, getting regular lab levels if, if they're on lithium to make sure that they're maintained on an effective dose. Um, and some patients may choose to to discontinue medications, um, in which case you would recommend postpartum prophylaxis. So I wanted to give a little bit of an overview of prescribing practices, and we can talk in more depth about lithium in particular. Um, so in general, our approach to prescribing, we say use what works, treat to effect, and simplify the regimen to avoid polypharmacy. Um, by this, it means, you know, if you're going to, if a patient's gonna be on a medication, if a patient needs a medication, they should be on a medication and you should use that medication to, um, to full clinical effect. So you really wanna treat it to euthymia. Um, that being said, we do wanna minimize the risk of exposures and so, really trying to simplify the regimen um, to just what is needed can, can be helpful to, to reduce the risk of, of exposures for the, for the fetus. Um, in terms of dosing, as I mentioned, um, there are a number of physiologic changes during pregnancy that can affect the dose of a medication. Um, so there's this increase in blood volume that can cause a hemodiluting effect, can dilute the, the levels of the medication, um, and then increased GFR, this increased renal clearance of the medication means they're clearing the medication more quickly. Um, and so you may have to adjust the dose accordingly and increase it over the course of pregnancy, which feels a little bit counterintuitive, I think, for a lot of prescribers because who are wanting to maybe minimize the risk and, and minimize the dose. Actually, in the second and third trimesters, we often have to increase the dose in order to maintain effect. Um, and one of the biggest ten tenets, I think, of prescribing is that the risks of untreated mental illness outweigh the risks of medication exposure. And that's generally true across the board, um, but especially with post postpartum psychosis and bipolar disorder, because the risks are so high. And, and, and include a real risk of, of suicide or infanticide. So a few things about lithium in pregnancy. It remains the gold standard of treatment for bipolar disorder, for depression, mania, and suicide risk. Um, I think for anyone who's gone through med school, we're always taught that lithium is is a, that that lithium is teratogenic and that there's this risk risk of Epstein's anomaly. Um, that risk is low, if at all. Um, we'll talk in a minute about some of the associated risks in pregnancy, um, but I think, as I mentioned on the previous slide, the risks of untreated illness far out outweigh the risks of the medication exposure. Um, so you, you want to continue lithium in pregnancy um, for your patients. Um, there are a few strategies that can help mitigate risk, which we'll talk about, um, but I would also recommend coordinating with the OBGYN and the pediatrician so that everyone's aware 
and can um, can manage appropriately um, any obstetric or uh, any obstetric complications um, or fetal complications if if they did arise. Um, and this might be for you know for for general psychiatrists, general uh, prescribers. I think patients on lithium or patients with bipolar disorder might be someone that you refer to a reproductive psychiatrist to manage because it does it does require a lot more um, attention and and it's 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 a it's a specialized sort of uh, uh, protocol to to treating these patients. So some of the risks with lithium. Um, First trimester exposure um, is is probably the time where we care the most about uh, fetal development. Um, so, you know, as I mentioned, Epstein's anomaly has historically been um, associated with a, a, with lithium exposure, um, but we've we've have a lot of evidence, more recent evidence that shows that the risk of cardio, cardiac malformations is quite low, if at all. Um, there have been statistically significant uh, associated risks of congenital malformations, so other malformations um, that uh, the, there, there have been a couple of studies that have demonstrated this, um, one of which was this study by Monk Olson in 2018 that had showed a odds ratio of 1.71, the confidence interval um, ranged from 1.07 to 2.72. So it you know, is above one, but still um, statistically significant. Um, so that's, which is to say that it's low, but a statistically significant risk of congenital malformation with first trimester exposure. Um, there is mixed evidence around the risks for miscarriage. There may be an associated risk, um, but studies have, have not been consistent um, in demonstrating that. The other thing we think about is neonatal toxicity. So what, what is the effect on the infant at the time of delivery? Um, floppy baby syndrome has been, um, is something that can happen to infants due to, due to high levels of, of lithium um, at the time of delivery. Um, other things to look out for are transient neonatal hypothyroidism, goiter, nephrogenic diabetes insipidus, cardiac arrhythmias, um, a lot of the effects that, uh, side effects that can occur with lithium can occur for the infant, but typically these are transient, um, and will go, will, will go away with supportive care. Um, there has been evidence of higher rates of NICU admission for these patients, for these, for these infants born to, uh, women taking lithium as well. So I wanted to give you a few updates on Lipstein, uh, Epstein's anomaly um, and with lithium exposure. So this is the one that I think everyone gets tested on in, in their exams. Uh, it's a Epstein's anomaly is a right ventricular outflow tract obstruction due to a displaced tricuspid valve. The baseline risk this occurs in one in 20,000 births. Um, the, the reason why it has historically been so strongly associated with lithium is, is that there was data from a, a registry in the 1970s that um, as, as subsequent studies has, have come out with pretty large data sets, we found that this, this vastly overestimated the risk. Um, there's a lot of bias here. There was, was a retrospective study, a lot of the um, Reports were by self-report. There wasn't a control group, um, and so you know that that uh, association has really stuck over the years. I think like generations of psychiatrists have been taught that you shouldn't prescribe lithium in pregnancy. However, recent studies have have shown pretty consistently that there's no statistically significant increased risk of cardio cardiac malformation once they control for maternal illness. Um, and additionally, that the risk, if it if there is a risk of cardiac 
malformations, it may be dose dependent. Um, and so a recent study found that, that at doses of lithium doses of 900 or above were associated with a low statistically significant risk, relative risk of, uh, of cardiac malformation. But at doses below 900, there, they didn't see any statistically significant risk. Um, and then the last thing I'll mention is, is floppy baby syndrome, which is um, an effect of uh, on, on newborns that's likely due to acute lithium toxicity. Um, it can present as hypotonia, so low muscle tone, lethargy, poor suckle. They can have arrhythmias or hypothermia. Um, again, this is this is typically due to lithium levels higher than 0.6 at delivery, um, and there are a lot of steps we can take to really uh, prevent prevent this effect from happening. So, we will often recommend a brief suspension of lithium at the time of delivery. So once a patient goes into labor or if they have a planned induction or a planned C-section to hold their lithium um, the day before they deliver and then restart it the day after they deliver. And then also give lots of IV fluids to the mother to really dilute the lithium levels. And this has um, been effective at reducing the risk of floppy baby syndrome and, and uh, other, other neonatal toxicity. Um, that being said, if it does occur, it's it's short-lived. Infants typically recover within one to two weeks. Um, and in the reports that we have, all of the infants recovered fully and there were no long-term developmental effects. So, um, you know, lithium, I think in general, it, it's very much indicated for patients who have bipolar disorder or postpartum psychosis, it really, really is the gold standard of care. Um, and the risks of untreated illness are too great not to give them treatment. Um, and we also want to make sure that that folks are aware of what the risks are so that you can adequately uh, manage um, and, and, and to do so in a team-based way. So working with pediatricians, working with the OBs to make sure that um, that these patients can have healthy, um, healthy pregnancies and healthy deliveries. Um, so I recognize that we're at time. Um, had a few more slides, but I think this is a good stopping point. Um, one thing that I did want to highlight before we wrap up today um, is a couple of resources for patients with postpartum psychosis. Um, postpartum Support International is an excellent, excellent resource for, for both patients and providers. They have a lot of, uh, they have a great directory so you can find reproductive psychiatrists throughout the country. Um, and they also offer a postpartum psychosis support group, um, which is really the only one of its kind that I'm aware of in this country. Um, and I, I think provides a nice space for people to meet other individuals who have gone through similar experiences and really process what has happened to them. Um, the other group that I really wanted to give a shout out to is Action on Postpartum Psychosis. This is a UK-based peer support network um, that is really phenomenal. They do a lot of community work, but um, they also provide printed material that I think can be so, so helpful. I think I give it to all of my patients and their husbands. They have, you know, packets on for the patients, packets for the partners to really help them navigate uh, recovery from postpartum psychosis and, and planning, planning ahead for future pregnancies. So just wanted to give those resources to everyone here so that you can dis disseminate to your patients. Um, oh, repeat the first resource. It was Postpartum Support International, uh, PSI. I'll put it, I can put it in the chat. And then Action on Postpartum Psychosis. And while you're doing that, Dr. Hart, I just wanna thank you so much for your presentation. I know we're a little bit past time. I also wanna say,
Um, the Motherhood Center is here for all of you. Um, we treat patients across the state of New York, both virtually and in person. Uh, and we have many, many reproductive psychiatrists on staff like Dr. Hart, uh, who specialize in treating women with medications in the perinatal period. We even do trying to conceive consults for patients that are thinking about becoming pregnant and want to talk to a repro psych about <clears throat> getting their meds correct before they attempt to start getting pregnant. Um, I know many of you have to go. Dr. Hart, I just wanted to ask one question of you. I think you touched on the breastfeeding question, but the onset of postpartum psychosis, how quickly um, can it happen to, uh, to a, a new mom? Yeah, so it can happen rapidly. It's kind of scary how quickly actually a person might um, develop symptoms. So we most often see it occur really in the immediate postpartum period in the first weeks after delivery. Um, some patients may have a delayed onset, but the most common presentation is really in the immediate postpartum and it can happen very quickly. Okay. I'm also, I know I'm available if folks wanna hang on for a little bit longer. I have I have like 10 minutes. If, if there are any other questions, I'd be happy to, answer or, or hear from you guys of, of where you're coming from and, um, and what kind of patients you're working with. I had a question with breastfeeding. Is it like totally not recommended or is there a way to work it out that maybe they pop and don't feed at night or they do formula at night and they nurse during the day? Yeah. I mean, I think, I think that's a great question. And I, we always try to practice in a very patient centered approach. So we'll give the recommendation to try to, you know, maybe not breastfeed. Um, I think I'm, I'm wondering if your question is kind of two parts. One is sort of breastfeeding in the postpartum in general, but then also breastfeeding on lithium. Is that? Yeah, I'm thinking also with benzos, like I'm saying to nurse with, like they're pretty strong medications. So I guess, yeah, that's one part of my question. And two is, can a woman with postpartum psychosis safely nurse, or it's not medic like from a clinical perspective, it's not recommended? Yeah, I mean, I think it's pro it's not recommended, but it's not contraindicated. And I think for most patients, the way that I talk to them is like to really get a sense of what it means for them to to breastfeed, um, and and how they want to, and how they they're going to balance sort of feeding their child with, with their own mental illness. Um, so with lithium, it is transferred in the breast milk. Um, and I think for a very motivated patient um, who's willing to undergo regular testing and have the infant undergo regular testing, um, it's, you know, it's possible to continue breastfeeding while you're on lithium. Um, like it's not completely contraindicated, but there are risks that there are significant risks that come with breastfeeding, um, which includes uh, uh, thyroid disorder um, and parathyroid, and also uh, there's a risk of arrhythmia for the infant. Um, so it's it does it doesn't come without risk, but but there are strategies if, for a very motivated patient to reduce those risks. Um, <clears throat> I think what also becomes difficult is balancing breastfeeding with, with sleep protection because um, sleep is probably the most important thing for recovery. Um, and if you're breastfeeding, it makes it really hard to, to, to sleep enough consecutive hours overnight. Um, and so it's it's different for, I will say it's different for everybody, but of the patients that I've worked with, the vast majority of them are coming off of the inpatient unit where they may have had to wean anyway because of separation from the infant. Um, so a lot of them have already weaned, um, but then they also make the decision based on, on sort of wanting to, you know, it's so, so, so scary to fall into a psychotic state. And once they reconstitute, they really are quite anxious about maintaining stability um, and maintaining their sense of self that, that it's a decision that's very, very difficult to make. But most of my patients have chosen not to breastfeed. I had a quick question. I was the one who had asked about the onset um, mm -hmm. and how quickly that can come on. Um, I'm curious, 
if if there's any risk of someone being in a such a heightened state of anxiety for so long combined with sleep deprivation um is is there any risk of of that turning into a, um, a psychotic break or a psychotic episode i mean it's i think it's definitely a risk it, it reminds me of a couple of patients one one of my patients and then the clancy case too where you know I think what was interesting about, I think at the very beginning, I had a slide on, on phenotypes. Um, and for a lot of folks, really presenting symptoms are more anxiety and mood symptoms. Um, and they may not have the language to describe psychotic processes, or they may not even be experiencing it. And there can be this sort of kindling effect where they're in this heightened state over time. And then whether it's like the passage of time or or in addition to environmental stressors that can really tip them over from, from one state into a more floridly psychotic state. Um, we've seen that happen a, a couple of times with patients who had, you know, they had a psychotic break seven, eight months postpartum, um, but it there had been, you know, there had been symptoms going on from uh, from right around the time of delivery. So that can happen as well. Do you have information, what was the, do you have information on other resources? Um, PSI should have Spanish. I feel like they even, I feel like PSI's hotline has a Spanish version of it. Um, yeah, it's in English and Spanish. Oh, besides PSI. Um, I would have to look into that. Um, yeah, I don't know if the Action on Postpartum Psychosis has a translation of their materials in Spanish. Um, we'd have to look into that. Sorry, I don't have... Huh? Any other questions for Dr. Hart before we wind down for today? Yes, Partnership for Maternal and Child Health in New Jersey. Excellent suggestion. Oh, awesome. Yeah. All right. Well, again, thank you so very much for joining us today. I hope you found this helpful. There will be a recording of it that we will share. Um, please stay in touch. We offer uh, educational seminars like this all the time, uh, and we will notify you the next one we have available for you to attend. Thank you very much, everybody. Thanks, Dr. Hart.